Hi, I'm Anna Galton and I work at the European Bioinformatics Institute um, in the Chemo Genomics team which maintains the Kemble and Shaw Kemble databases. And today I'm going to tell you a bit about the druggable genome and the concept of druggability. So what is druggability? I'm going to cover its importance in drug discovery, an overview of the different methods you can use to assess this, from precedence or ligand-based methods through to structure-based and sequence-based methods and then um, also talk about different approaches aside from just small molecules. Um, then I'm going to give you an overview of kind of the size of the druggable genome as it stands now and some of the applications in things like target prioritization. So what is druggability? Um, definitions of druggability vary. It could be defined simply as the ability of a protein target to bind small molecules but sometimes this might be more appropriately called ligand ability, or it could be defined as the likelihood of finding orally bioavailable small molecules that bind to the target in a disease-modifying way. So this includes um, consideration of pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic properties of the compounds, whether the target is related to a disease. This is obviously harder to ass assess, but could be more predictive of drug discovery success in the long term, um, whereas identifying whether a protein target just binds small molecules is slightly easier to assess. Um, I'd really opt for a definition somewhere in the middle, so the ability of a protein to be modulated by a drug like small molecule. So this implies you're somehow modifying the function of that protein, but you don't necessarily need to know what disease it's linked to. Um, and when we talk about orally bioavailable um, or drug-like small molecules, what do we really mean? So um, Chris Lubinsky, who's a medicinal chemist at Pfizer, um, came up with something called the Rule of Five um, back in 1997. He basically looked at all of the drugs that were available and what kind of physicochemical properties they had. And he observed that um, molecules were likely to have poor absorption or permeability if they violated more than one of these rules. So ideally, the molecular weight of the compound would be below 500, the log P would be below 5, the number of hydrogen bond acceptors would be less than 10, and the number of hydrogen bond donors would be less than 5. And this is really a rule of thumb that could be used to define whether a molecule is drug-like or not. More recently, people have gone further, suggested other descriptors that can be useful, like the number of rotatable bonds, the polar surface area of the molecule. Um, and Andrew Hopkins' group at the University of Dundee have come up with a method called quantitative estimate of drug likeness, or QED, um, which really builds on the work of Lipinski and provides a more quantitative approach rather than just a yes-no rule. So bearing this in mind, in order for a protein to bind a drug-like small molecule, the protein needs to have a binding site that has complementary properties. So it needs to be the appropriate size to accommodate a drug-like ligand. It needs to be buried to have sufficient surface area to interact and not too polar, not too hydrophobic either, but it needs to have the right balance of properties to complement a drug-like ligand. Um, and things like really large exposed polar sites can be considered to be harder to drug than smaller, more buried hydrophobic pockets. And this next slide just shows an example of two different proteins with different types of binding sites. So the binding site on the left in phosphodesterase 5 could be considered to be what we'd call a beautiful binding site. Um, whereas the CMV protease on the right hand side has a much larger, more exposed polar binding site, and it's much harder to find good drug-like ligands for this kind of target. So why do we really need to assess druggability? So omics techniques are producing large amounts of data relating um, genes or proteins to diseases that we're interested in studying. So there are lots of genome-wide association studies and sequencing studies that have identified mutations linking particular genes to diseases. Um, there are large-scale expression studies comparing disease versus normal tissues, proteomics, metabolomics studies trying to find biomarkers for diseases. Um, and really, when interpreting all of this data, we really want to know which of these proteins that we've identified as being relevant to a disease are going to be the most successful for a drug discovery approach. If we consider that maybe only 15% of the human genome might be druggable with a small molecule, um, what we really need to do is we need to intersect um, the proteins that are likely to be druggable with those that are likely to be disease-linked and identify the most promising drug targets from within those. It's important to be able to prioritise the targets that we identify and pursue those that are most likely to be um, amenable to a particular approach. So if we choose a target that doesn't bind small molecules, we might spend a lot of time doing screening experiments, HTS, etc., and not find any good hits. 
But even worse in some respects, um, we might find hits for small molecules in a screen, but if we choose a target that doesn't bind drug-like small molecules, this might lead to failure even further down the line because the compounds that we identify from those screens might have poor pharmacokinetic properties and not have good absorption and really not work when we get into the clinic. So we really want to assess this um, as early as possible. And it's estimated that around 60% of projects may fail at the lead identification or optimization stages. So we have a number of different methods we can use for assessing drug ability. Um, these range from precedence-based methods where we already have compounds that are in the clinic or even are approved drugs that bind to that target. And these give us the highest level of confidence in drug ability. Um, through to ligand-based methods where we may have endogenous ligands, tool compounds or even good drug-like compounds but that haven't yet reached the clinic. Then we can use structure-based methods if we have a crystal structure available for the protein. And then finally, we can try to use sequence-based methods to um, really analyze those proteins where we don't have any other information. So I'm just going to cover um, some of these different methods and how you can find information using various public resources. So firstly, looking at precedence-based assessment. If a protein is the target of an approved small molecule drug, this gives us a pretty high degree of confidence in drugability. It also gives us some other information, so targeting this protein may be relatively safe. Um, but there are some caveats. It's not an absolute guarantee of success for a different disease or a different product profile. So, for example, the existing drug could be an antagonist and you require an agonist approach. Um, it could be a systemic um, drug, but you really need central nervous system penetration for the disease that you're interested in. Some drugs have long or short acting effects and the acceptability of side effects shouldn't be underestimated as well. So for example, um, a cancer drug might have um, quite a lot of adverse effects that wouldn't be acceptable for something um, for a less severe indication. So I work on the Kemble database here at Emble EBI and what we try to do is extract scientific information from the literature and organize it into a structured form. So we take full text papers from the Journal of Medicinal Chemistry and other MedChem journals. We extract information about the compounds that have been synthesized in those papers, the assays that have been performed and their targets, um, which could be protein targets or it could be um, things like cell-based assays. And we extract the quantitative endpoint data as well, so binding measurements, things like KI values, but also functional assay measurements and admin toxicity measurements. And we organize this into a structured way so people can query for particular targets or compounds that they're interested in. On top of this um, medicinal chemistry um, bioactivity data, we also lay out annotation around approved drugs and clinical candidates. So we try to identify the type of molecule, whether it's a small molecule or an antibody, the indications that that drug's used for, and the molecular targets of the drug. And we hope that using this information, people can derive insights and tools for drug discovery. So really the data within Kemble tracks the full discovery process. Um, so the medicinal chemistry literature data that we extract really covers the discovery stages of the drug discovery process um, through lead discovery and lead optimization. And then um, we aim to track clinical candidates and drugs to cover the clinical stages of the drug, pro drug discovery process. Um, we try to assign molecular targets to approved drugs, as I mentioned. This is not trivial in many cases. It's not a black and white thing quite often. And there are different rules for how you can assign drug targets. So, for example, you could choose to use binding affinity measurements and really annotate a target if the drug is known to bind to it at a, a high um, potency. You could um, consider compound selectivity, so um, if a drug is non-selective, binds to all members of a protein family, for example, then do you include all members of the family um, as the drug target? You can try to consider the approved indication, so should you only include a target if you have evidence that it's responsible for the efficacy in that particular disease? And then you could also consider expression data, so which targets are expressed in the particular tissue that's relevant to the disease that the drug's used for, and maybe you can narrow down the choice of targets further. And then dealing with things like protein complexes, so a lot of drugs bind to protein complexes rather than individual proteins. Do we include only the binding subunits where the drug actually interacts, or do we include all subunits that make up that complex? And these are just a couple of examples to illustrate the complexity of actually assigning drug targets. So tiotropium is a drug that's approved for COPD. 
Um, it's a non-selective muscarinic antagonist, and there are five members of this protein family, um, so it binds to all five family members. But it's actually a topical, a topical agent that's inhaled, um, and it's believed that the M3 receptor is the one with the highest expression in the lung has been linked to contraction of smooth muscle um, in bronchoconstriction. So based on the fact that we know it's approved for COPD, then we could try to annotate more specifically the muscarinic M3 receptor as being the key efficacy target there. Um, another example, benzodiazepine drugs. Um, these are approved for various indications, including insomnia. They're well known to be positive allosteric modulators of GABA-A receptors. Um, but GABA-A receptors are heteropentameric complexes. Um, and they have different combinations of alpha, beta, and gamma subunits. And there are six known different alpha subunits, three beta subunits, and three gamma subunits. Um, we also know that binding of GABA, which is the endogenous ligand to the receptor, occurs between the alpha and beta subunits, and that benzodiazepines bind between the alpha and GABA subunits, but only in um, some of the specific alpha subunits, so they don't bind to alpha-4, alpha-6 containing receptors. So how do we represent this kind of target? Um, we could just include all of the possible subunits. We could try to further narrow down the classification. For example, it's been shown that alpha-1 subunit is particularly important for insomnia, so we could try to further narrow down the specificity. So we did try to tackle this in Kemble. We've assigned um, manually curated efficacy targets for all of the FDA-approved drugs and also um, antimalarials. And we try to annotate targets with which we know the drug directly interacts, so the molecular targets, not other downstream or pathway targets. Um, we try to limit these targets to those that we know are responsible for the efficacy in the approved indication. So we're not including targets that could be linked to adverse effects or other indications for which the drug is not yet approved. And we're not assigning targets just purely on the basis of pharmacology data, although if you're interested in that, you can find that information within the Kemble database. For each drug, we try to annotate the type, whether it's a small molecule or antibody, the action type, so whether it acts as an agonist, antagonist, inhibitor, and then um, also where we have information, we can annotate the binding site of the subunit within, say, a com protein complex where the drug actually interacts. And so we have a number of different ways of handling targets within Kemble. This is just showing the molecular targets that we have within the database. Um, so some drugs do interact with proteins, but others actually interact with um, DNA or with the ribosome. Some drugs actually target small molecules, so things like antidotes for metatrexate. And then even within protein targets, um, we have drugs that act on single proteins, like phosphodiesterase 5. We have drugs that act on specific protein complexes, so for example, integrin alpha 4, beta 7. We have drugs that act on less well-defined protein complexes, like the benzodiazepine receptor example that I gave earlier. We have non-selective drugs that might act as all at all members of a protein family, so for example, muscarinic antagonists. And there are a few drugs that actually um, disrupt protein-protein interactions as well. So we're able to model all these different types of targets. And if you want to find the list of approved drug targets, um, you can go to this Browse Drug Targets tab within the Kemble interface and download um, all the targets um, in a tab-separated file and do further analysis with them. We're also trying to include clinical candidate information. So if a target has compounds that have already reached the clinic in phase one, two, or three trials, this also provides good evidence that the target is druggable. Um, particularly if um, a candidate has reached quite late phases, then it's likely to have shown a degree of safety and a good pharmacokinetic profile as well, so that we can get additional information from those cases. But a lot of the databases that provide comprehensive clinical candidate information are commercial. Um, within the public domain, there are some resources available, but it's harder to find all of the information relating to the targets. So clinicaltrials.gov is a freely accessible database of clinical trials. Um, it's required to register all US trials within the database, um, and they have information about the compounds that are tested, the indications, the phases of development, so what stage the trial is at. And you can search this or download data. Um, but it doesn't contain target information in, um, in a large number of cases. <laughs>
Similarly, people often apply for a United States adopted name for a compound when it reaches around phase two of clinical development, sometimes earlier or later. Um, so if we track applications for these USAN names, um, then we can get a good idea of the compounds that are within clinical development. Um, but as I mentioned, it's quite difficult to then identify the targets for all these clinical compounds. So this usually requires searching of published literature, sometimes pharmaceutical company pipeline documents contain information, um, and other web resources. Um, there's a useful paper that was published by GSK quite recently, um, which lists some of the targets that are in clinical development, but it doesn't provide links back to the actual drugs that target those, um, those proteins. We could also try to use bioactivity data, such as that contained within Kemble, to identify potential targets for compounds, so those targets that the compound is most active against. This is no guarantee that they're really the targets responsible for the efficacy for the indication. And um, the United States adopted names that I mention um, have rules for assigning stems within the names, and these can give you some clues as to the mechanism of action of the compound. So names that end in PANEL, for example, are AMPA receptor antagonists, names ending in KIRN are renin inhibitors. So sometimes this can help with target assignment too. Um, within the latest release of Kemble, we have target information for around 900 clinical candidates, and this is going to be expanded in future releases. So we're currently going through this process of collating the information and trying to assign the efficacy targets. So even if you don't have knowledge of compounds that are within the clinic, we can use other ligand-based methods to try to assess um, whether a target's druggable. So there are a number of public resources that exist that capture pharmacology data. So Kemble, I've mentioned already, um, PubChem, Bioassay is a large database based in the US, um, which has a lot of high throughput screening information. BindingDB is another database who curates um, information from the published literature, particularly around binding affinity measurements. And then the Guide to Pharmacology is also a good resource um, for identifying um, pharmacology data um, for key drug target families. And the existence of a compound that binds with high affinity to a protein um, implies that it's druggable. But it's also important to consider whether the compounds that you see are actually drug-like. Um, so it could be that there's a small molecule that binds to the target, but it's, it doesn't really obey Lipinski's rule of five. It's not a very drug-like compound. It could be too large or polar. Um, and we can also consider things like selectivity issues. So all the compounds that bind to a target, non-selective, then it could be harder to pursue that target. So this just gives an indication of um, how the bioactivity data is organized within Kemble. So you can search for a protein target and then go to a report card page. You see a summary of information about that protein target. And then you um, have these little uh, graphs that you can click on to go through to a bioactivity data view where you see all the individual um, binding measurements, for example, that have been recorded with links back to the publications that they came from. Even if you don't have medicinal chemistry compounds um, for a given target, even knowledge of the endogenous ligand or substrate for protein could be useful in assessing drugability. So if a, a protein is known to bind a small molecule within the body, um, there's no reason you might not be able to find a good drug-like small molecule as well. And you can identify databases that have ligand information um, and try to use these to identify additional proteins that might have small molecule binding sites. Again, Guide to Pharmacology has quite a lot of um, endogenous ligand information. You can also use crystal structures in the protein data bank. So if you go to PDBE, for example, you can look for all the crystal structures that contain small molecule ligands, and, and that implies those proteins are druggable. Um, it's, careful, it's useful to consider the type of endogenous ligand. So if the ligands are peptide or protein, for example, like proteases, um, it's likely to be harder to drug these type of targets than if the endogenous ligand is itself drug-like. This just um, shows the Guide to Pharmacology resource. So the targets within this database are organized by different protein families. You can um, click to go through to individual targets within these families, and then you can view ligand information for that target. So they have a wide range of information around typical tool compounds, endogenous ligands, and also um, drug-like compounds and approved drugs in some cases. 
um, together with binding affinity data and links back to publications. Even where you don't have any ligand-based information, um, you may be able to use structure-based methods to try to assess the drugability of a protein. And these methods really rely on identifying cavities within crystal structures um, and then assessing these cavities to try to predict whether they have appropriate properties to bind drug-like small molecules. So typically um, what's done is to take a test set of data from um, the protein data bank where you have co-crystal complexes with drug-like ligands bound to them. And then the properties of these, um, the cavities where the drug-like ligands are bound are assessed. Um, you can calculate lots of different descriptors like volume, surface area, polar surface area, degree of burial, etc. And then um, train an algorithm to distinguish the properties of those um, cavities that do have drug-like ligands bound from other cavities that don't have drug-like ligands. And then you can apply these rules to new proteins. So if you have a novel crystal structure um, which has been solved, you can try to identify all of the cavities within that protein and assess them to see whether the properties suggest it could be a, a drug-like binding site or not. There are lots and lots of different algorithms that have been developed to do this kind of thing. I won't go into all of them today. Um, there's just um, one example that I've chosen because it has a nice web interface um, where you can actually interact with the predictions. So DOG Site Scorer um, was published in 2012. Um, it was trained on a data set of around 1,000 targets that had been manually assigned to one of these categories, either being druggable, being difficult to drug, or being undruggable. Um, and they used a support vector machine approach um, to build uh, a model for whether targets were druggable or not. And you can go to this um, web server and try out the algorithm. All you need to do is select a PDB structure that you're interested in um, analyzing. Um, you paste that in, and then you get back this nice um, kind of graphical display. So down the left-hand side, they show all the different cavities or binding sites that they've identified within the protein structure um, and some of the properties of these sites. And then each of these sites is assigned um, a druggability score. The ones shown in green at the top here are predicted to be druggable. Those at the bottom in red are predicted to be undruggable. Um, and then you really get back some nice information. So on the right-hand side, you can see um, a picture of the protein structure with each of the cavities highlighted. So it's not sort of a black box method in so much as if you see that um, site P0 is predicted to be druggable, you can then see where on the crystal structure that is. Um, and really that could be very valuable information later on for things like structure-based drug design. Ligand-based methods are great because they give you a reasonably high degree of confidence in druggability, um, but they can't really tell us anything about novel targets. Structure-based assessments, similarly, they give us um, something really concrete to work with, a pocket within a crystal structure. Um, but if we don't have a crystal structure available for our protein of interest, then we can't really apply those methods. So we really need additional methods to help us to prioritize the remainder of the proteins within the human genome, or indeed within other genomes, um, such as those of parasites. Um, so there may be many druggable proteins within these genomes that haven't really been investigated previously. And we can use homology in some cases, so we can do a BLAST search and identify whether a sequence is similar to a known drug target. But again, this is really only telling us about past success and won't really take us into identifying novel families. Um, but there are some other sequence-based methods that can potentially go a little bit further. So the earliest definitions of the druggable genome, for example, a paper in 2002 by Hopkins and Green. Uh, relied on identifying um, the drug binding domains within known drug targets and then identifying other proteins con containing those binding domains. More recently within Campbell we've curated a list of known compound binding PFAM domains. Um, so you can see the list um, at this link here. And really what we did is go through all of the targets that we have within Kemble, identify um, the domains that we know compounds are likely to interact with, and curate a list. So then you could use this list um, to do um, sequence similarity or domain analysis of other proteins and try to identify additional proteins that have one of these known druggable domains within them. This takes us a little bit further than just using sequence similarity alone, um, but again, it's still based on past success. <clears throat> 
So people are trying to come up with more general methods um, for defining the features of a good drug target. And machine, le machine learning methods can be used here. Um, so since these are generally based on amino acid sequence only, they can be applied to whole genomes. They don't need any other information to be available like structures or ligands. And the basis of these methods is to calculate a large number of different descriptors from the amino acid sequences. So this can be things like amino acid composition, length, hydrophobicity, the presence of certain features like transmembrane domains, signal peptides, glycosylation sites, and then taking into consideration things like predicted secondary structure, domain composition, or subcellular localization, which are all things that can be predicted based on the sequence. And then by defining which descriptors are enriched in known drug targets versus targets that are not known to be druggable, um, we can really come up with a model that will help us to predict whether a protein is druggable or not based on which of these um, descriptors um, it satisfies. And um, there's an example of this that was being published by Andrew Doig's group at the University of Manchester in 2009. Um, there's also a nice review from Han et al., um, describing these kind of approaches and what they can do. So if you want to know a little bit more about some of these methods, those are good starting points. So I've covered really the methods that we can use to assess small molecule druggability of a protein, and this has been historically the approach that um, has been most desirable for pharmaceutical companies. But based on our best estimates, the overlap between small molecule druggable proteins and um, disease modifying proteins may be relatively small, as I showed at the beginning. Therefore, we might need to consider other, other approaches to target proteins that don't necessarily have beautiful small molecule binding sites. So these could be um, inhibiting protein-protein interactions, or using um, protein therapeutic or monoclonal antibody approaches, or even other approaches like siRNA. And monoclonal antibodies in particular are becoming increasingly important in drug discovery. Um, so last year there were 45 new molecular entities, so brand new drugs, approved by the FDA, and 20% of those were monoclonal antibodies. So this fraction is really increasing year on year. So the ability to target a protein with a protein therapeutic drug such as a monoclonal antibody largely just depends on the extracellular location of the protein. So a protein needs to be secreted or plasma membrane bound, um, otherwise it won't be accessible to a large molecule like an antibody. And we can determine this in a number of ways. So if we know there are known protein therapeutic drugs already available for target, we can use that information. Um, but we can also use um, annotation and experimental evidence um, contained within resources like Uniprot and the Gene Ontology, um, which really tell us which proteins are already known to be membrane bound or found in plasma or secreted. And then um, these resources also have predictions as well. So proteins that are predicted to have transmembrane domains, predicted to have signal peptides, which suggest they could be secreted. And there are also subcellular localization and um, prediction algorithms that can be used. So if we use um, a resource like Uniprot, which is shown at the bottom here, for example, we can get quite a lot of information about the cellular localization of the protein. So moving on to um, trying to target protein-protein interactions. So even if we don't have a small molecule binding site on a protein, it's almost certainly going to in participate in protein and protein interactions of some sort. So if we're able to modulate this interaction, that could be a highly effective means of modulating the target. However, protein-protein interaction surfaces are often large flat surfaces, so they're not really beautiful binding sites. So targeting these large flat surfaces is quite difficult, particularly if we want an oral small molecule drug. And you're more likely to end up with something um, that's a pe peptide mimetic. But um, research has shown that these surfaces may still have hot spots, so sort of sub pockets within the larger surface that contribute most to the binding affinity. And it may be possible, if you have knowledge of where these hot spots are, to design smaller inhibitors that specifically target these areas of the surface. And there are lots of algorithms that are being developed to predict such hot spots and try to assess the druggability of protein protein interaction sites. I'm not going to cover all of these, but there are a couple of examples have um, review articles here um, that are really useful if you want to know more about this kind of approach. Um, finally, also to mention um, the Timbal database um, that's maintained at the University of Cambridge, and this has a large amount of information on protein-protein interaction targets and their inhibitors, so that's a good starting point if you're interested in this kind of approach.
So we really covered all of the different um, methods that one could use to assess um, drug ability. So just trying to put all of this together. Um, so this is kind of my view of the druggable genome based on data that we have currently within Kemble. Um, I wouldn't take the numbers here too literally because really depending exactly what data sets you include and um, what criteria you use, um, you can come up with slightly different values, but it's really to give you an idea of the kind of scale of the druggable genome. So if we consider just the targets of approved drugs, and I filtered out some of the really non-specific um, drugs that have that bind to large numbers of molecules. We have around 400 um, proteins that are known to be targeted by small molecule drugs that are already FDA approved. And we have around 100 um, targets for protein therapeutics, including um, things like recombinant proteins and antibodies. And there are a small number of targets um, that overlap that have both small molecule drugs and protein drugs. If we try to expand this out to include um, clinical candidates as well, um, there are maybe in excess of 300, 350 um, proteins that have um, protein therapeutic drugs in development um, or already approved. And then for small molecules, um, we don't yet have a comprehensive set of clinical candidates within the Kemble database, but there's probably in excess of 1,000 targets that um, maybe have small molecules within the clinic. If we then expand this out further, so um, targets that have drug-like small molecules within the Kemble database, but where those molecules aren't already in the clinic, um, we can expand this out to around 2,000 different protein targets. And then if we also include some of these predictive drug ability methods, um, including domain similarity and structural methods, for example, we can expand this out to maybe 3,000 or more proteins. For the biotherapeutics, if we include all extracellular targets um, based on annotations within things like Uniprot and gene ontology, um, this could be between around 2,500 and 4,000 different proteins, depending whether you take into account the more predictive methods like signal peptide identification or just those ones that have concrete experimental evidence at the moment. And if we combine all this, because there's quite a significant overlap between extracellular proteins and small molecule targets, um, maybe around 5,000 proteins in total that could be targeted by one of these two approaches. So this is around a quarter of the human genome. So knowing this information, knowing which proteins are likely to be druggable or not, um, how can we really apply this information? So it's quite critical to use this for things like target prioritization. So if you're doing um, biological experiments or looking at biological data that links targets to particular diseases of interest, and you have a large number of potential targets and you want to know which to pursue, um, using this drug ability information can be really valuable. So if you know that the target already has an approved drug, for example, this can suggest a drug repurposing opportunity. Um, targets that have clinical candidates, for example, um, would be really highly druggable and therefore there's a high chance of success that you can pursue that kind of approach. Um, if you know that the target binds a small molecule, again it might be um, much easier to start um, a drug discovery program around this target already having chemical matter that you can use as a starting point. Um, and then if you know the protein's extracellular, if you think a monoclonal antibody approach could be suitable for that indication, then this would really allow you to try to um, pursue those, um, those targets. And again, just members of known druggable families um, or proteins that contain domains that have known to be drugged in the past um, can help us to identify potentially novel targets but that could be tractable with small molecule approaches. So I just wanted to give a, a couple of examples of how this information can be really applied within drug discovery context. Um, so this is a publication um, from Nature a couple of years ago um, and the authors studied a large number of subjects, um, a lot of whom suffered from rheumatoid arthritis, and um, tried to identify genetic variations within these um, patients that were linked to the incidence of rheumatoid arthritis. So they identified 101 different risk loci um, within the genomes of those subjects um, that were linked to rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and then when they look at where these loci actually are, map them to genes, um, there were around 98 different candidate genes that they identified. And many of these loci were actually novel and hadn't been identified in previous studies. So you have these 98 genes, where do you want to go next? So this is really where the drug target information can come in. And the authors looked at whether any of the candidate proteins that they identified were targets for existing drugs, both approved and experimental. <coughs> 
and they found that 27 of these proteins were already targeted by approved drugs for rheumatoid arthritis. So they've, con they've con basically confirmed the genetic associations with known um, drug target information. Um, but also, as well as those targets, they identified some additional proteins that had drugs on the market, but those drugs were for other indications, not for rheumatoid arthritis. So these are potential drug repurposing opportunities. So, for example, CDK4 and CDK6 were identified among the candidate genes. And um, parboseclib is a compound that's been recently approved um, for breast cancer and actually targets these two um, cyclin-dependent kinases. So this could be a potential drug repurposing opportunity um, that could be quite a quick win in terms of um, you know, really using the output from this genetic study. So you can see that understanding the mechanism of action and targets of existing drugs is quite crucial in exploiting this biological data that's being produced. Even if we didn't have any drugs or clinical candidates already um, available for um, a particular target, then knowledge of drug ability information can still be used um, to prioritize which proteins might be suitable for further follow-up. So particularly, for example, if you have tool compounds all already available, you might be able to test those proteins um, in a disease model and see if there is any um, kind of impact on the disease that you're looking at. And you can do more large-scale analysis. So um, you can try to as assemble um, across all different diseases that you might be interested in, um, all the biological evidence that you have that links um, a target to a disease. Um, so this could be things like expression data, text mining information, genetic associations, and also knowledge of um, clinical projects that are already being carried out, perhaps by other organizations. And you can assemble this. Um, this information in order of confidence in biology. So um, just the fact that a protein is expressed in a particular tissue doesn't give you very strong evidence of disease linkage, whereas um, something like a very statistically significant genetic association or the presence of a, a project in clinical development would give you much more confidence. And then you can overlay the drugability information onto that, so increasing confidence in chemistry, if you like, through from the drugability prediction methods, um, the ligand-based methods where you have chemical tools available for target, um, clinical compounds, and finally approved drugs. So by combining all this information together, you can really see each one of these dots would represent um, a potential protein or target. You can try to identify areas of space um, for your particular disease that you might want to look at. So up here we have um, reasonably high confidence linking a target to a disease, and we already have drugs or clinical candidates available. So those could be potential repurposing opportunities. On the left-hand side, you have um, sort of relatively weak information linking the target to the disease, but you do have chemical tools available. So these approaches might be quite high risk, but they are testable. So you have a compound you could potentially use in a disease model um, and see if there is any effect. On the right hand side, um, we have high linkage to a disease. Um, we don't have any clinical compounds already, but we do have chemical tools. So again, these are lower risk opportunities and they are again testable. So this might be an area you would want to pursue quite quickly. And then um, moving down further, if we don't have any chemical tools available, but the target is predicted to be druggable and there's good evidence linking it to a disease, this is an opportunity to try to identify some novel chemistry for these targets. Um, which we predict would have a good degree of success because the target's druggable. Um, and then right down at the bottom, you have strong linkage between a target and a disease, but the target's not predicted to be druggable, so this is where um, a novel biotherapeutic approach might be used. So this is just to give you an idea of really how you can use this druggability information, knowledge of the druggable genome, to help further drug discovery. And that's all I really wanted to talk about today. So just a few acknowledgements. Um, the whole Kemble team here at EBI, particularly those who've curated all the drug target information, and lots of our collaborators, um, both at Pfizer and elsewhere, who've um, really contributed to um, the kind of evolution of this work. And there are a few um, references here, um, some of the things that I mentioned during the talk.